Hi, Chris. This is Chris Thorpe Tracy and John Pratty in conversation about a derelict Coral, the America Ground residency. Hello, Hi. John. Hi, Chris. Um, let's talk a little bit first about what this project is about. Um, we're here to talk about your artist in residency uh, project in the America Ground in Hastings, funded by Arts Council England. Um, and we're, we're going to be talking for about an hour about how you have developed the project, how you've created the pieces of work that you've created, and also just to show us a little bit of what you've created. So, Chris, can you tell me a little bit, just really quickly, about who you are? Yes, yeah, so I'm uh, Chris Thorpe Tracy. I am a composer and a writer, and I work in a kind of sparse folky uh qu quarrelly sort of way i spent 20 years as a pop singer and gave it up maybe uh two and a half three years ago um but at the same time as that i've done quite a few projects that are more composed and more responding to brief type projects and find myself really enjoying those and so this is why i'm having a lot of fun doing this um I'll just show you that I've got um, the keyboard here, positions. It's a kind of annoying that you can't see it all the time. But so what I'll do is um, I'll waffle on quite a lot about my process, but I'll also share a couple of excerpts of uh, pieces that I've been working on um, uh, using this keyboard. Uh, before I do, though, before I get really into it, um, I'd like to ask John, where did you get the idea from to cover this particular bit of Hastings history. It's quite an unusual bit of history, especially because a newcomer to Hastings would immediately think of an earlier period of history, which is obviously the Battle of Hastings. But this is um, uh, the America ground is something that grew up at the very beginning of the 19th century. And I wonder why uh, you were interested in that particular bit and um, in, in a way also, because in modern Hastings, it's not the bit that people think about, like um, it's not as shishi as Hastings Old Town. It's much more like just a kind of corner of the town near the seafront. So what, um, what inspired you to um, organise an artist residency to tell this bit of the story? Well, there's two, two answers to that, Chris. The first one is, We've changed quite a lot in this project very recently because of the COVID-19 um, emergency. Yeah, so yeah. Now, hence doing this. <laughs> we were going to have a showing, we were going to uh, introduce a public event, but what we're now going to be doing is produce these, at least three of these conversations online using Zoom, uh, which will be pretty interactive and will inv involve some of the, the music that we're creating. What started the idea? What started the idea was my long-standing interest, I guess, in the politics of the 1830s and the 1820s, and how those are mirrored today in the politics of today. It's about um, homelessness, it's about an unfair society, it's about many things that we have today, which they had in the 1820s, 1830s. They had soldiers and sailors returning from the Napoleonic Wars. They were in many cases without work, without houses, and they in many cases were, well they were of course, nearly all without the vote. So they had very little going for them and they lived in a very unequal society. So I'm very keen on exploring any parallels between the history of 1825 to 1835 Hastings and the parallels today and the core of the project was knowing you Chris from the nine from, you know from our work to, together in Brighton um, 10 years or so ago five or so years or so ago where I knew you as a, a committed political musician and activist and it felt to me like the important opportunity in Hastings, following on from some digital work we've been doing, the important opportunity was to bring someone in who could create some work which was accessible, which was in a relatively 
um, accessible and conventional creative format as opposed to say digital art or data art or stuff like that we wanted something which was particularly going to get to grips with the more colorful issues and colorful historical occurrences that we know happen so that's where it came from chris that's great over the go, go on, on. <laughs> um over the past five years or so by complete coincidence i've done two previous residencies that were focused on the exact same period of history and i'd have to say before that time it wasn't a particular interest of mine the early 19th century um, but i did a, a residency in brighton at the royal pavilion which is obviously one of the very poshest buildings of the early 19th century where uh, prince george the fourth partied and then i uh, did a residency up in Nottinghamshire for the National Trust uh, which was at the workhouse in Southwell and that is I mean that building was built within 15 years of the Royal Pavilion so they're very contemporary to each other and they obviously exist at the absolute opposite end of the <coughs> excuse me of the social scale so the workhouse was one of the proto kind of model workhouses that was put up that kind of set the standard for the other workhouses as they went up around the UK and that's how they dealt with the poorest and the most vulnerable people at the time. And then to lead into this residency, it's the same period of history. And yet it's another, it's almost like a third way entirely, which is the America ground is a space where property and people, pe people moved in and built their own property and created uh, a community in the heart of the town, a very bustling, busy, thriving community a kind of completely outside the legal structure and completely away from either the posh or the or the kind of uh, state control i i think that's it lo i loved it because it it um it f almost forms a triangle with those two other buildings hmm cool so <clears throat> what did you think when you first heard the america ground legend did it I mean, this idea that uh, a group of people got together, squatted land, raised the American flag, apparently declared independence. What were your initial impressions of the American Grand story? Well, partly, first, real excitement that this is a story that's right up my alley, but that I'd not heard before. I didn't know this existed in Hastings. Um, it really has powerful resonances to more contemporary um, issues around squatting and housing over the say the past 50 years in the UK it reminded me when I first heard the story of um, the Christiania anarchist free town squatted free space in the heart of Copenhagen which I'm a big fan of and obviously it ties in with the idea of countercultural movements not just from today but right through history the idea of spaces that are where the people will for usually for a sort of brief period before the, the state comes in and stamps them out although Christiania is still there almost as a kind of semi-blessed tourist attraction now in, in Copenhagen but the historically these spaces have this kind of you get a fixed period of time where they they emerge and they become really interesting and then of course they get stamped out which is precisely what happened here I really like that as a as something to explore I was really shocked that it was so close to home you know, I only live uh, 45 minutes from Hastings in Brighton, never heard of it, never knew it was a thing. And and it really ties in, again, to what you said just a minute ago, it ties into the current picture of when you have uh, a government of the right that is more likely to be pulling back at the state's investment in people, then you are going to get a load more social deprivation. And also in this country particularly the class inequalities emerge again and we are seeing that and even before the outbreak of coronavirus we saw you know we've been we've had a few years where uh, class has become uh, a much more sharp pointed thing again and i just really wanted to find out more in, i mean in a way from our very first yours and my very first conversation john I just was curious, sort of really curious to know more about how it worked and what the people were like who lived there and, and how, um, how, you know, what the fractures were at the edges of it. And then, of course, how it, how it ended. Now, there's that core central story um, uh, about the point at which the inhabitants of this corner of Hastings 
who are fiercely independent and not paying taxes and effectively squatting in the town, there's a moment where they raise the American flag and that's where they become known as the Americans. And that in and of itself is a really fascinating story. Um, the American War of Independence was only maybe three decades earlier, so it's still fresh part of everyone's history. And so the American flag would have been a, a really um, powerful toxic symbol. I was thinking also about how close it was to the Napoleonic Wars. The first inhabitants of the America ground do start living there while the Napoleonic Wars are still going on. And so that idea of raising a foreign rebel powers flag during a time where we're at war with the French is really powerful to me. I really liked it. So I wanted to find out more about that and see how it all worked. Of course, at the same time as the uh, uh, Napoleonic Wars, the, the French had an alliance with the American state. Yeah, yeah. And the, the, the yeah. There. Yeah, we, we are the, yeah, they're very much that picture of, you know, you've got a community of people in southern England who are refusing to conform to the ways that um, early Georgian society wants them to conform and are also exploding and very successful, like as we'll probably talk about later, this, this, uh, this area, the America ground, the population explodes, the trades and the, the stuff that's going on there explodes. And of course, it's also a nefarious, exciting, sexy part of town where lots of stuff can go on. Um, but all of that's happening at the same time as they're refusing to kowtow to the, the establishment, the, the um, aristocracy and the, landed people and all of that and it's that's it's pretty amazing really yeah so i mean you talked a second ago but in, in a moment we'll talk about the residency process itself but there's anything else you can say about uh the connections with modern movements around contemporary squatting or housing or counterculture movements i mean brighton itself has harry cowley the first real kind of leader of the of the of the squatter movement after the first world war yes and i'm not sure what i want to say about that hold on let me think i think the parallels with housing and squatting are actually if anything more potent and more um real with the america ground to say what happened over the past 40 50 years of british history in places like brighton and london than it is the kind of more overtly political side, although it is very political. I think there are a lot of people here in the America ground in between, say, 1800 and, and when they're finally evicted in 1835. A lot of people are just um, getting on with their lives in the way that squatters want to. They, they, although there is a sort of big political part of squatting and of also of just the, the kind of housing campaigns, the general campaigns around social housing and trying to get uh people trying i don't know the more political side of it mm. the the there is that focus just on we want to live our lives and this and and in the case of uh, the america ground it's the state and the very few richest that are making that really hard mm. um so i i really liked both that there is a real flag waving political dimension to the story but also there are just a bunch of people there are there's a lot of brewing going on there's a lot of um there's a lot of garages that store things and people that repair things and of course the whole um architecture of the america ground springs up from rope walks as well so there's a there's a big long rope walk along the seafront in hastings that uh sets up the architecture that will continue for generations i'll i'll um one of the songs i'll do a little bit of a bit later is about the rope walks and um, all the idea of the rope walk and uh, it has a huge impact on architecture and social the way people's social lives work so it's um, a place of labor and a place of socializing mm. as much as it's a big political story mm. okay so let's talk about the artist residency process itself i mean mm. originally we talked about this being a musician in residence residency um you were keen to call it an artist in residence opportunity tell us a little bit about the process itself what what did you do to start with and what what kind of stages are you going to go through with the project 
So pretty soon after I first arrived and wandered around and um, you guys showed me around this various spaces, um, I realised I needed to sort of split the residency into two sections. One was to do first a, a kind of a research process. And at that point, I didn't know how that would pan out, um, but I needed to learn a load. And one of the specific things I was really keen to do, um, which is obvious, but is what I wanted to do was find real people and find their stories mm. and find um, named actual people who lived in the America ground or who had an impact on the America ground, whose stories I could in some way tell and turn into a thing. And at that point, I'd say I didn't even, I had no idea how musically it would be. That was just the first instinct. So I thought the plan was straight away to first do a research process and then do a composition process. And so I spent the first um, a couple of months regularly visiting Hastings and spending two or three days at a time um, in the America ground. Um, and then I would, uh, gathered it was like a gathering of information and a, or, or even more particularly it was a gathering of stories um, and then I switched to a kind of composition process which was much more head down um, working at the, the keyboard or working at my laptop trying to find a route into telling these stories in music and in song um, I'm at this point so we're speaking at the beginning of April and I am kind of halfway into that process right now I would I, or, or coming towards the end of it but I'm not I'm still immersed in that process at the moment probably the biggest difference because of what's happened with COVID-19 is that I was hoping that second risk uh, the second part I was hoping that the um, composition process might some of it might also take place in Hastings in situ to enable a kind of uh, presence that people could come and say hello and look at the work as it developed um, and we started vaguely drawing up plans to do some of that and of course that's now impossible but in a way that doesn't matter in terms of the composition from my point of view um, sitting here in my home composing music is exactly what I would normally do so that's that's totally fine um, the research process also was made massively easier because you guys had Julie Gidlow on board as a history researcher. So basically you attached her to my project and uh, gave me some of her time. And she did an amazing amount of research for me. Partly she drew on her own researches that she's already done. She's based in Hastings. She's a history researcher. So she already, already has, so she, so she already has a reservoir of knowledge. But also she, when I found kind of particular bits that I was really interested in, that I'd dug up myself, then she went off and did the kind of more professional grown up history research and found out some more details and sort of um, uh, filled out some of those stories. Although I should say when you're looking for individual stories in Hastings in, 80, in the 1820s or the 1810s, it's pretty tricky because um, the the records at that point there's no for example there's no um local newspaper that, that lasts all the way through that era that you can find stories from it's all a bit hodgepodge and court records as well because um, most of the court things happen out of town especially the big decisions as relating to the america ground but anyway so she did a lot she did a lot of that heavy lifting julie goodlow took a lot of that load from me um i was based for the research part i was based mainly in two spaces um, I worked with Hastings Museum and they were very welcoming and I went to Hastings Museum quite often on a Wednesday when their reading room is open um, and during that time I also hooked up with Steve Peake who is probably um, the area's most, uh, has spent the most time specifically researching the America ground, he is in the process of a book about it. Um, and I sort of uh, spent some time chatting with him and I looked up stuff myself. And then I, when I wasn't at Hastings Museum um, and when I wasn't wandering around the America ground uh, itself, I was based in Hastings Library, which is on the America ground. It's in the Brassey Institute, which is right in the middle of the area we're talking about. 
and I uh, based myself in a corner upstairs at the library and they were also very welcoming and uh, dug into the reference books and some of the maps and some of the records that they've got there. Um, so that was a really fascinating process. I very quickly realised the limits of my skill as a history researcher, which is why it was really helpful to have Julie there. I kept, I kept, um, I kept thinking I could find stuff and then looking in completely the wrong place for it. And that I, I realised that as an amateur history researcher, it's fine. But if you want to do it really well, um, I, I'm not in any way trained. Um, I also learned a lot about during that process. Um, and this is aside from learning the stories themselves. I learned a lot about the kind of understanding of conflicting histories and different people's different takes on events as they happened. And at one point I got quite down because some of one of the one of the people I spoke to um, overturned some of the more exciting stories or I thought he had. And then it transpired that in a way that was just his take and that some of the quite exciting stuff does happen or as many people who are as just as well informed believe it happens but there are kind of other voices that think it didn't happen in the same way i mean and then coming from the outside to try and explore that uh, that's a really challenging interesting process of realizing that history is not set in stone and when you've got one particular view of how a bunch of events take place and then another particular view you can't it's not even a binary it's you can't even just go oh this person's right and this person's wrong everyone's got different takes on how things happened and i really enjoyed that process actually it's, this is the most uh it's the most in-depth i've ever gone into a fixed story a uh, one particular period of history uh, ever in my in my life and I, I sort of feel as well particularly because of following on from the two previous residencies in the same period of history that i'm now accidentally almost too well informed on, on uh, the early 19th century England. It's, uh, it's, uh, I seem to sort of, I make lots of, I keep finding I make lots of little connections. Um, bless you. I keep finding I make lots of little connections to previous residency work. Mm. And of course it's really shocking just the context of once you've learned how opulently George the third, uh, once you've learned how opulently Prince George, who would become George IV, lived, and the kind of sheer level of indulgence that he lives in in Brighton Pavilion. And then once you've seen how hard the struggle is for people in a workhouse in the same era who are within the aegis of the state, and then you look at these people in the America ground trying to build their lives outside that and with as little input from the state as possible, and that all they want is to be left alone to do their stuff. It's uh, it, it's a really vivid spinning of little firing of connections between the residencies so yeah i had a really enriching time doing the research um and uh and i and i did come up with i think there are a bunch of stories that are really worth telling so um, the thing isn't it chris it's not actually about whether the flag was raised and what flag it was it's not about some of those contested facts it's actually about telling the story of the, the social landscape of that era isn't it which is pretty much factually agreed by everyone yes that's absolutely spot on john that's it's it is <clears throat> it is a very uh, yet yeah, mm, sorry excuse me it is agreed by everyone how these people lived and how they fought to live yeah. and and uh i had a kind of that sort of shape because there were because the raising of the flag is such a key thing. I mean, we could talk about it a bit later. Did it happen or it didn't? I'm now of the opinion that it totally did. And it was a big deal. Um, and I, I mean, I even think, like I think, I know the date it happened, which I think it happened on the 19th of July, 1832, which, wow. is, the, which is the day of the banquet at the Priory Meadow. And the banquet at the Priory Meadow is the banquet to celebrate the the parliamentary well uh, you know the big parliamentary reform act that came into law mm. which was the which was it was coming all the way through <laughs> as as the america ground was building up between you know the very beginning of the 19th century and into the end towards the end of the 1820s the pressure on people's lives because because there isn't parliamentary reform there isn't true democracy is absolutely astonishing um oh, i've forgotten the numbers i had 
I'm just going to find a stat, if you don't mind. Mm, go for it. It's extraordinary. It... So, 1832. So, when the, when the Reform Act when the um, parliamentary reform bill changed everything in democracy, you can get a complete comparison of what it's like for Hastings, because in Hastings prior to that, in 1831, 24 people had a vote mm. in our democracy. And in 1832, the male middle class gets a vote and 800 people get a vote after that point. Now, I'm not saying that that's real democracy or what we, want in the world because that was still middle class property owning men but to go from just a handful of individuals at the top of a town to 800 people at the top of a town having democracy was a huge deal yeah. and um and also bear in mind it by 1832 so um as the america ground gets more populated massively so at the end of the 1820s a big thing occurs which uh is that the, the, the legal system agrees and confirms that the crown owns the land because the land was reclaimed from the sea. So this patch of land that we're talking about, it, the, they've pretty much known that the crown sort of owned it, but then come the late 1820s, there's a court process, a legal process between a bunch of posh landowners and the aristocracy, and they agree and accept that the crown owns that land. None of the people who live on the America ground have anything to do with that. In fact, the, the legal case is taken, it's in a different town, so they don't know it's going on. But once that ownership is confirmed that it's the crown that own the land, that's when in 1829, um, everyone who lives on the America ground is told, right, you have to pay rent now, you have to pay a lease, and you've got six years. And in 1835, you're gonna be kicked out. That happens in 1829. And so, they all kind of know where they stand. They've got this six year period where they've got to pay and they're trying not to pay, but they've got to really. And, they're, and it, it, that's the bit where there must have been, or there were big rubbings up between individuals who can't pay, but don't want to leave and the state. And then in um, 1832, when the Reform Act happens, mm -hmm. that must have been such a big empowering moment. And in Hastings, they have this huge party on Priory Meadow, a big banquet gigantic and the the group of a large group of people from the america ground go to that party and i'm pretty sure i mean steve peak is 90 percent sure and i think all of the local historians pretty much agree that they did try and they did raise the american flag in their kind of parade up to the party and i mean so i can say that maybe they did so with permission because they checked first but still, that's such a huge symbol to be raising as you pile into this huge party to celebrate a reform bill. It's a, it still counts. It still counts. As, yeah. And if they didn't, it still counts. You know, it's, it's these people's lives. It's a huge part of their, their story. So, um, sorry, I'm really waffling about no, it. No, it's fine. I mean, have we said, actually, that this, the reason that uh, this piece of land existed in the first place was because it was... Uh, effectively a harbour which was gradually silting up and people found themselves building on this unadopted land which no one could agree on who owned it it was basically um people it was the last place they could find to set up home and to set up their businesses wasn't it yes and it the land had been reclaimed there'd been a series of massive storms in the hundred years before here this time and that has, that's partly the silt from the storms is what had reclaimed the land. Also, um, it's derelict before they move in. Mm. And then it's derelict afterwards because, and this is another thing that reminds me very vividly of what happens in squatting nowadays and what has happened in the history of property ownership, which is that those who have lots of property leave loads of it empty. They don't need it. And those who have need have to fight to get access to the property. And an example of this is that in 1835 when everyone's evicted from the america ground it then lays completely derelict and dormant for 15 years 
The, it's not like the crown does anything to it or sublets it. The crown just, they've proved they're right. They've got rid of all the people and they leave it abandoned for 15 years. And at that point, people in Hastings call it the desert because it's just this great big splodge of empty land. So it's another resonance for me of that difference between the haves and the have nots of this, this, this is somewhere that people needed to live as a last resort. As you say, it was like the last possible place they could live. And still, when the powerful forces removed them from it, it was just left empty. Okay, let's move on to the music now, Chris. Um, so we're going to talk a bit about the pieces that you've, you've, you've put together and your composition process. Yeah. Um, so tell us a little bit about a derelict chorale and how you've gone about making the work. Yeah, I, I, I look for... A, before I start and when I'm still deep in research and learning things, um, I was looking for a way in. I was sort of looking for a route in. And obviously my first port of call is folk music and is simple folk songs. I would like ballads, you know. Um, uh, but at the, And I, you can end up with just, oh, well, here's like a bunch of, each song is a different story but I really wanted a, a way in that was a little bit more focused than that and maybe drew a thread right through the piece or the pieces and also um, because I gave up performing I come from very much a sort of point of I want something that uh, uh, it is not about me as a performer um, I've really struggled to separate myself from the kind of ego of being a performer so that's one part of it but also there was part of the brief of this project was to um create something that could maybe be taken afterwards you might want to talk about that a little bit more maybe later on um so i was looking for a route into the pieces and i started um with like the first song i began to come up with and the first route in and this is a bit um uh, off piste maybe but uh, uh, it was something called One Plank of Wood and I was tracing the journey of a single plank of wood. And the reason for that is so you can get a plank of wood that's in a, in a tree in a forest, maybe in the Forest of Dean or in the New Forest near Portsmouth. And you can build a, you chop that tree down and you build a boat and that boat can have a plank of wood on it. And then um, that boat can tootle around the South Coast or around the world. And um, during the late, 18th century and the early 19th century we were in the midst of lots of very violent battles between smugglers and uh, the customs and excise men particularly along the south coast and so one of the things that happens at the beginning of the america ground and in fact i'll um i'll use a different song as a, I'll, one of the songs i'm going to use as an example in a minute is about this but um there were very violent battles and when the customs and excise men caught a smuggling boat they would run it would be run up on the sea and they would destroy the hull so it was no longer seaworthy so they would cut the hull in half or smash massive hole in the hull so then you've got the same plank of wood sitting on the on the seafront at Hastings and then people would use those hulls as a home and people would actually build their house inside this boat hull and also of course there were wrecks there were loads of wrecks it's the most shipwrecked area of the south coast apart from maybe the Isles of Scilly and it's got all these wrecks and so very good quality planks of wood would be washing up all the time on the beach and people would use that as building materials so my one plank of wood then has taken this journey it's now in someone's home in the America ground where it stays right through to the end when the America ground people were evicted and then and this is one of the best bits a lot of the people who were in the America ground when they were evicted they took their whole homes on their backs like on on carts and they literally dismantled their homes because building materials were so precious and many of them were builders and many of them were working to build the new town of St Leonard's on Sea at that point and they were employed as uh, builders and they were also skilled craftsmen so it was within their skill set to do this they took down their houses moved to where there was space to live in St Leonard's and built their houses again there where some of them still exist to this day. There are, there are a bunch of houses in St. Leonard's on Sea, which I've had a look at, which are built of the same materials. As, and so that was my, my route in when I found it, was this idea that you could have a plank of wood that takes the journey right through the America ground life and end up 
ends up in St. Leonard's and is still there now. So that was great, except that uh, it didn't tell any human stories. So uh, I was struggling to like, if I, if I do a whole, if I create a whole piece of work, like almost a piece of music theater about a plank of wood, then yes, I can put the stories around it, but they don't quite work as the core. Uh, and then, so now I think I've got one song, which is called One Plank of Wood. And what I'm trying to do at the moment is see if my other songs, which are self-contained songs in a kind of folky, fairly simple style, can have in, injected into them references that mean a plank of wood is there. That, that sounds really weird, but like, um, <laughs> If, if, I can, if I can create a thread, and then if I keep my original Plank of Wood song as a, it might almost, it could be an overture. So it could sort of, here's the, here's the scene at the beginning, and then here's all these stories, and then you realize that all the stories have a Plank of Wood in them. Um, uh, one thing that happened then was, so at that point, when all, all of this was bubbling around, I was still thinking about a, a folk, a very much a folk, a trad folk, like a set of ballads or a, a traditional folk project. Um, just give me one second, I need to um, plug my computer in. Very sorry about that, I didn't know it I'm wasn't sure We can edit, we can edit. Um, so my starting point was these was very tr trad and um, and as I learned more stories, that was definitely my way in. Was So I've got this plank of wood. I've got a bunch of people's stories I want to tell that take place in different parts of the American ground. I've got two or three key major events I also want to talk about. So I want to talk about the raising of the flag and I want to talk about the eviction. And I want to talk about um, how, how it affects now and, and what it means. Like, for example, so I'll, I'll actually I'll play a bit of a song now. Um, one of the things that informs the shape of the America ground is the rope walks uh, or the rope walk, the main rope walk. And I wanted to do a song about the rope walk. Um, and this is sort of an example of how the song starts off as a, a certain kind of folk song and then um, goes somewhere else that I would rather be. So it starts off in a kind of, um, um, so this is, I'll play maybe, a, a, a bit of a verse and a and I'll play the chorus maybe I'll play a couple of verses and a chorus of and this is how it first starts and it's got that a kind of music hall -y, folky that kind of um I'll start I won't start at the beginning um, so I'll explain what a rope walk is it's a um a rope walk is a really long straight um pathway that becomes an alleyway mm. where people make rope for ships and it has to be straight and it's very long and they still exist now and um uh, it's a very hard job making rope it's horrible and it, but it's part of the the fishing industry and the seafaring industry infrastructure so it's very much needed and also these rope walks which went up uh at the beginning of this kind of period that we're talking about a lot of them although there have been rope walks earlier in history um they when they go up they go up early in an industrial estate development and then that industrial estate tends to be kind of built around them and that means that um rope walks from this period still affect the layout of hastings excuse me rope walks of this period still affect the layout of hastings today and it's in your eyes and it's in your hair hope Hemp dust burns in the open air. Run to the other end fast as you dare. Doing the rope walk tangle. Eight over three and a seven over one. Weave those threads till your rope is done. Don't you step on the side. Don't you step on the fibre, son. Doing the rope walk tangle. So it starts off in this kind of very <laughs> Chaz and Davey, um, rollicking-y vibe. And that's what I... I really liked it. I thought this is what I was doing. So, and when you're done, then you roll that rope to the boatman's door for some cash, you hope. It's Edward Bomer and his brother Joe doing the rope walk tangle. Well, sir, it's worth more and you hold out your cap. Lad, tell your master his weave is slack. 
Oh, John Gallup won't pay for that, doing the rope walk tangle. And it carries on like that. And the problem with that is, it's, it's a, it's, so for me, it's really fun and I enjoy twiddling around and doing it in a kind of pub piano sort of way. But then one of the aspects of this project was looking outwards and making the music simple so that other people could take the music as a sort of starting point and work from it. And also another point about the project was I personally don't want to be singing. Um, I don't enjoy singing anymore. And um, uh, in a way that that style relies too much on on me being me as a singer. And so I've been I've been like looking at how how I change the style to try and um, partly make it more singable by other people and partly make it more workable by other people. And you end up with a kind of more droney thing. So I went through this whole slowing it down. I mean, that's one of the best techniques so that if you are gonna have a group of people singing your stuff that's not you, you slow it down. And at this point in the process, I had, I had maybe four songs ready. And what I was really getting into was the idea of a choir. And I suddenly started thinking about that this is a, a choral piece rather than a set of folk ballads. And even though the melodies are gonna stay quite folky, and even though the, the kind of mix and mash of old style language and new style language is a very folk oral tradition sort of trick, I started wanting to compose in such a way that uh, a large group of singers that are not necessarily professional. I don't mean rubbish, but I mean <laughs> fun, good quality amateur choir. If they picked up this stuff, they could go, oh, well, we can do this. And also that uh, creates the opportunity for pop-up performances and for performances mm. by different kinds of groups. Yeah. Um, one example of that was uh, we did talk about, and hopefully one day we might do this, where you can put the choir in situ, inside the America ground, maybe even in, in the alley, around behind where the Brassy Institute is and where Rock House is, which is right in the center of this actual location. And you can, and you can put a group of voices in there in the open air and it works as a, a, a choral piece, um, which is quite tricky with a Chaz and Dre piano thing, but um, you can, it's in your eyes and it's in your hair. Hope does, but I'll start that again. <laughs> it's in your eyes and it's in your hair. Hemp dust burns in the open air. Run to the other end fast as you dare. Doing the rope. Walk tangle. Eight over three and seven over one. Weave those threads till your rope is done. Don't you step on the fibers, son? Doing the rope walk tangle. And then you try and sell the rope when it's made. Oh, when you're done, then you roll that rope till the boatman's door for some cash you hope. It's Edward Bomer and his brother Joe doing the rope walk tangle. Sir, it's worth more and you hold out your cap. Lad, tell your master his weave is slack. Old John Gallup won't pay for that when he's doing the rope walk tangle. Eight over three and seven over one. Weave those threads till your back is gone. Don't you step on the fibre, son. Doing the rope walk tangle. Oh. <coughs> Excuse me. <laughs> so, you end up with two different feels. I'm, in some ways, especially when I just play it here, um, I don't think the slower version particularly works. Uh, it hasn't got um, an energy to it. 
But what happens is if you transfer that to a group of singers mm. and you have, so obviously in the background, you might have a very simple accompaniment or you might even just have a thud. And I'm a, a massive fan of the thud. Like you get a tom or you get a side drum mm. and you just boff it. Foreign, right? yeah. And one of the advantages with that as well, especially thinking about the music of the early 18th century, uh, of the late 18th century and the early 19th century, is that that is a huge part of our folk music at the time, is that kind of instrumentation, is a simple thud and something, usually a fiddle maybe. I mean, this is before we had guitars and banjos and mandolins, so it would be a, a fiddle, even... even um, uh, I mean, I shouldn't get sidetracked with a big talk about the folk music of the time, but even the accordion and the concertina are not central big parts of the folk world that early on they are they are like after the after the 1850s maybe they become a, a bigger part of our folk world so you really are talking about a thud and a bit of fiddle to achieve that kind of vibe um one of the other reasons i really like the the rope walk as an idea is because it it does in a way it does the same thing as the plank it you've got the layout of Hastings now affected by this alleyway that's really long, almost a mile long, that's like laid out specifically to make rope. You've also got all the classes there and um, you've, got the, you've got the fishing industry, you've got the, the more big kind of ocean going shipbuilding industry, and you've got um, the person who's running, running the ends and ends of this rope walk trying to actually do the weaves, this, just it's a really bottom end job. You've then got the masters of those people, so you've got a kind of hierarchy of of employment in that same in that one trade, and loads of other things going on around it. It's where loads of brewing, so you've got loads of you've got booze being, and you've got um, these uh, garages for, especially later on in the America Ground era, you've got garages for coaches for the trade for the travel up to London. A lot of coaches are stored there, and that makes it a kind of hotbed of import and export i mean it's this huge import and export is a huge part of and that i don't necessarily mean <coughs> global i mean e including just trade between hastings and london and other towns in that part of the, the world probably illicit as well <laughs> well that's a really good um it's <laughs> a really good uh um one of the stories uh, that's a really good john that's a really good um link into um another thing i was gonna mention which is this this, uh, which ties back to what I was saying earlier about the hulls of boats from the battles of the smugglers. Um, at the very beginning of our era, and, and actually as a holdover from the 1700s, you've got, um, uh, you've got a lot of smuggling going on. And that countercultural attitude that pervades in the America Ground later on, I feel is very informed by the loyalty that local communities had to groups of basically legit fisher business people so local business people who end up out of necessity smuggling and it's not i mean some of it's even like so they're smuggling with, with other businesses in france and we're at war with france so that's extraordinary but also they're just smuggling on moving goods along the coast um and uh, another example of a song uh, i really look, i've got a song uh, which is called the murder of captain aldridge which is a song about which tells the true story of um of Captain Aldridge, who was a captain of a boat that ran into trouble with the customs and excise men, and uh, they murdered him. They shot him as uh, as they did. Now this is this is the era before legitimate police forces. Um, in fact, in the town, in the America Ground itself, and in the town of Hastings at the time, the only kind of police you'd have is the old night watchman. Who mm. you know you didn't have. Um, this is pre Robert Peel, but um, uh, the most powerful, nasty, hardcore forces of the law, apart from the army, was the customs and excise men, and they were absolutely brutal. Um, so tell us a bit about um, Captain Aldridge then. What was, uh, what was the story behind his murder? Well, they just, they caught him. Uh, they caught the boat. There's a, there's a customs and excise boat that was really slick and well, a really proper, like, fast boat called the leopard and the leopard caught captain aldridge and his men out at sea and they and they uh, dragged the boat they and they basically shot him dead and then um one of the reasons that we know it's a beginning of a kind of real hotbed of anger and activism 
is because um, the uh, in the at his funeral. Well, I'm going to sing. I'm sort of introducing what I'm going to sing. So maybe I'll just um, sing the mm. sing the song. Yeah, go for it, Chris. Yeah, I, I'm going to sing. Um, maybe so. This is um, the other thing I mentioned about this is it's a. Uh, so the murder of Captain Aldridge, I did write in a when I was still sort of thinking very folky, in a in a in a ballady style, and I haven't. I I went on a I went on a journey in in um, two directions. So I started it very much like a, with an acoustic guitar balladeering, and then at the point where I was moving away from that. I've been playing with drones and I went to a point of quite electronic -y drones and I'll give you an, a little example. I've got this drone, which is sort of a droney loop. I hope you can hear it. Um, and so I started thinking that was the kind of direction I wanted to go in. But then uh, uh, more recently, uh, maybe last week, as I've sort of been working on these more intensely at home, I ended up going back in the other direction, still with the drone, but thinking, well, actually, I can, I can, I don't have to throw away the music of the time or the instruments, but I can still have something, as I was saying, you could have just a thud and a minimal drone and build something underneath that. And so I've taken that, that kind of route with this song. I won't, I won't start at the beginning. It's quite long, this one. I'll start from his funeral. Um, let me... Well, they put him in the ground at All Saints Church and a crowd of people came alongside the Greek. <coughs> Sorry, I'm coughing. I'm going to have to start again. Oh, wow. I'll tell you what, John, I might add my drone into the keyboardy sound and see what it sounds like with it all mixed together. Can you actually hear it all? Yeah, I could hear that. Oh, cool. Well, they put him in the ground at All Saints Church and a crowd of people came alongside the grieving family and anger grows the same. And a fury at the rich man's court where nothing good is done. And a fury at the customs man so quick to shoot his gun. Willful murder that it was, said the world and of the church. Shows us all where he's written it down in the All Saints register. Men like Captain Aldridge are the lifeblood of this town. They brand a good man, a criminal, smash his boat and shoot him down. They take our boys for Boney's War, give our town to Wellesley's army. But if bread costs more than a man can afford, there ain't no honest work for me. You ain't no fucking Napoleon. You ain't no mad King George. Let the word ring out across the ground. We ain't gonna give you any more. So one of um, my feelings about the myth versus the truth thing is that you can finesse aspects of or focus on aspects of the story without denying their underlying truth so for me um the every detail in the captain aldridge story that i've put into the song is accurate it really is so it's all the right names and the one of the key 
pieces of the history that legitimise the accusation that he was murdered is the church warden writing that it was murder in the register at All Saints Church. And once that happened, it can't be unwritten. That's written into the church ledger. So that's a really important bit of the document. Um, and so I really wanted to include those details. But at the same time, the bit that's slightly finessing is, for me, the, this idea that the, this specific event is a kind of a triggering event for rebellious revolutionary feeling among the people of the America ground. Mm. So in the placement of the song in my collection of tunes, that will be there, where once that's happened, I'll start telling stories of people being much more um, political or, or tell stories of the, maybe go to the point about the flag raising. And so it almost sounds like I've, sounds like that happened and then suddenly everyone refuses to pay their taxes. And whereas the truth is obviously that's a much earlier event. It doesn't directly, um, it's not like Captain Aldous's funeral triggers everyone being revolutionary, but it did happen. There was a big crowd that showed up. He was very popular in town. He was considered to have been murdered unjustly, even though he was out smuggling, because the point was this took place uh, very early in the 19th, 19th century, and it was before that Reform Act. So people really had no way of surviving if they didn't have an income. And so it was drastically unfair that these, and you know, people were not, people were not really profiteering from smuggling. They were smuggling as a, as a daily bread business. It wasn't that they mm. were becoming huge rich whatever it was, a, it was a subsistence economy yes it was a subsistence black economy yeah. and it was uh, an important part of that and so um for the customs men to be so regularly violent i mean they're constantly murdering people and and to be fair what happens is an escalation of violence on both sides so you get smugglers become more and more they they start to get armed they, then they get more heavily armed because it becomes almost like a little nuclear arms race between the customs men on the south coast and the increasingly violent gangs of smugglers but but i think the point is um there is that feeling which you do get with rebels or with people doing nefarious things um often criminals build their communities up that in this era much better than the state does nearby and mm -hmm. treats people a lot better so that's my that's my little bit of finessing of of um what actually happened but the details of aldrich's funeral and the the night as well i haven't sung you the opening verse because i i really can't sing it yet but the um the the they come around they basically do get a uh, surprise attacked coming around the coming around the what's it called the white the big white coming head. the white rock yeah and so it's a yeah and it's an awful i mean it's awful and also at the time you've got you know you've got kids being forced to go off and fight napoleon you've got um you've got no, no sense of welfare whatsoever. You've all the all the wider contexts that make it a kind of. Um, uh, sorry, I've run out of steam. No, 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 it's okay. So as you develop the composition, it sounds to me like you want to thread a narrative through it, and you, it it certainly feeds from the early parts of the the cycle of songs through to the latter part of the cycle of songs, and you're you're telling a kind of you're you're. You're painting a kind of a political picture here in order, yeah. aren't you? I am. I the bits that resonate most powerfully for me are one, that this is a really fascinating place that then gets taken away. Mm. Two, that in such hotbeds of life and thriving and, and often out of control, you know, it wasn't easy life there and it was rough, and there are lots of fights and battles and things that go on there, and it's 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 rough and ready and we know those places now but the the snobbery and alienation that is put upon them is far more than it really is and then also those places are also where a lot of the greatest aspects of our spirit comes from there's there's a real there's an amazing community there there's uh, amazing um, ideas that come out of the place and and energy that comes out of it do you think that that's uh... I mean, Hastings is obviously a pretty amazing place now. It's 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 a, a fascinating. It is. It really is, and I didn't know it before. But yes. Do you think that its roots, its modern roots, go back that far to those those years of intrigue and insurrection? 
I think they yeah. do. I think you see a lot of the kind of um, uh, I think you've that that uh, non-conformist spirit that that is in certain places and it's definitely present in Hastings. I think comes from the these places that have had have. Ha it's almost like they're a frontier between people and the state and mm. other places aren't other places are deeply comfortable within the state. And I think Hastings is one of those partly because of the partly because of long before the America ground, you've got an, the uh, just a simple um, geological layout of where Hastings is nestled uh, in this kind of little dip into the, to, into the sea. It's got almost got secrecy to it, hasn't it? It's got, um, and then also the other big part of its history with the, uh, with um, being part of the the Norman Conquest and all of that stuff, mm. um, yeah, I want. I think I think Hastings, the way that people in Hastings celebrate Fat Tuesday, mm. which, is, which is actually a traditionally quite an American festival, and I know lots of people who live within fifty miles of Hastings who've never heard of Fat Tuesday. They they'd know what Pancake Day is and they'd know what Shrove Tuesday is but they wouldn't have a massive festival of live music on Fat Tuesday. They wouldn't be familiar with that ritual. Mm. But that ritual goes straight back to the big, the rock fairs and the, mm. and the big parties. And Hastings, like Brighton is a party town of the wealthy and of the, the queer and of the technologically pushing forward. Like it's mm. a, even back in, even at the same time. So, you know, um, Prince George is nurturing loads of new technologies so that he can have the best house basically mm. he really does he get you know anything from flush toilets to whatever he really wants the best house and so he nurtured he's like google and then and then hastings is a party town in a very different way which is just normal people who won't be trodden down who will have a big party mm. that sounds good to me hopefully going forward we may be able to have a big party again well, it would be amazing. I know it's a little <laughs> rough right now, but it would be really amazing if... Um, Absolutely. So just yeah. keep the work. You're, as you said before, you're making it so that other people can perform it. Um, yes. Part of the plan is to hand it on to others in the town, isn't it? It so is. Talk about that briefly. I'm really, I mean, I'm really excited about this. It's such a great idea. It wasn't my idea. It's part of how you develop the project, but uh, I really love it. I'm going to record very simple um clear sounding minimal demo recordings of what i think will be either 12 or 13 songs and they'll form this sequence they do they do stand alone a lot of i think pretty much all of them stand alone as songs but they do have this thread running through it's partly a thread of a plank of wood it's also the thread of the story of the america ground chronologically so it starts at the beginning and you get the you get the eviction towards the end of the bunch of songs and then after the eviction you've got a kind of quiet desolate derelict moment at the end so it does tell the story i think in sort of way in a, in a interesting way i won't impose very much arrangement on it i'm gonna very minimally arrange it mm. record it um i'm gonna try and um, get a couple of local singers to sing it rather than me or with me so that um there are different voices mm. And I'm gonna, yeah. what I didn't do when I've just been singing to you, it's not ideal situation for singing because I don't do it anymore. And also just because I'm sitting face to you. But what I didn't do was emphasize the, the fixed melodies. So obviously when you compose something, as opposed to when you're a folk singer, you, you fix the melodies. And I think the recorded version and the score, the vocal score will have fixed melodies. I mean, that, I don't mean that that means people have to sing, but it means that people will know what the melody is so that they can sing it. And at that point, I will, you all have it. And then the idea would be people could, if they want to play with the recordings, they could remix the recordings and do something interesting with that. They will be recorded to a click track. So that means they will be recorded to a, an electronic even rhythm that musicians use to, to remix and play with tracks. So even though they'll, you won't be able to necessarily hear that, um, if anyone wants the stems, which is like the individual parts of the recording, they can get them and they can put them into their own recording devices and record and play with the tracks. So that would be one thing. But also people can hopefully take the score and arrange it in a different way and perform it in a different way. My dream now, because I took this little journey from 
creating a folk piece to a to a what is a chorale I hope is a chorale um will be my dream would be for a choir to be able to perform it with a minimal mm. introduction um, with a very minimal <coughs> accompaniment I think if that works I'll be really happy that's fantastic I think we're heading towards doing that in the summer <coughs> Assuming that we're all allowed out again in, in public, um, I believe that MSL uh, will be in position to get to that part of developing it, um, at least in the summer or on the other side of that. So that's fantastic. Thanks very much for talking to us today, Chris. Oh, no, thanks for having me. It's been fascinating. Yeah, great stuff. What's the next thing that you're going to do? There is talk of a... Um, an enhanced Spotify playlist? Yeah, I've started work on that. It's actually really good because um, uh, uh, I'm gonna, so uh, that was your idea as well. <laughs> um, I've started work on it. I think it's gonna be really good because there is quite a lot of stuff on Spotify that matches. Yeah. I'm going back to the era and I'm looking for pieces that, uh, often folk pieces to be honest, songs from the time, songs from Hastings, maybe even contemporary songs. I've, uh, found a couple, I've found a couple of things that are more recent that reference the American ground that are really interesting. And just other bits of music that have influenced my thinking on the Spotify uh, playlist so that everyone can have a listen to them. Um, uh, I have... And then also we're going to do a talk with you where you tell us track by track about the story of each one of the yeah um focusing on the kind of content of each story the lyrical the actual story it tells and where i've been a little bit cheeky with the truth or where i'm sticking to the truth i love this being in a position as an artist rather than the historian because i love trying to get things as close to the truth as possible and i'm using lots of real names all the real names that you heard in those songs are real people that were doing that thing at that time so that's all right. But at the same time, I know I've got this kind of artistic license as a, as a songwriter to, to mess around with that and be a bit cheeky. Um, uh, do you know that there's a folk singer, a really well-known folk singer? Um, do you know Noah Gillette? Have you heard of Noah Gillette? Yeah. So the, the fisherman. Because I see, I knew of Noah Gillette and I knew, I've heard some of his balladeering and I've, I added one of the tracks to the Spotify playlist. And I had no idea he was, you know, he was a Hastings fisherman. Mm. And so he's one of our kind of most celebrated, lost, great traditional folk singers is, is a fisherman at Hastings, which is really interesting. Um, I, I, I think, so we'll do that and we'll have this kind of collection of inspirations. Mm. And um, uh, as well as that, I think, I think it, it is tricky when we're not allowed out. But <laughs> I would like to be in a position maybe later in the year to still perform it and mm. to gather some people. As long as that's not imposing on or get, treading on the toes of people who've taken it off and doing their own things with it. Mm. But maybe if we do end up able to put a performance together later in the year, we could combine the two so I could perform bits of it and other people could do what they liked with it. And we could see yeah. some sort of combination of that. Fantastic. All right, then. Let's finish now. Um, do you want to play us out with a little bit of something? Uh, song. Just finish off with a little bit more of the uh, the ballad of uh, yeah. Captain Aldridge, the murder of Captain Aldridge. Yeah. Oh, I've, I've put the wrong bit on. Here we go. I'll tell you what I'll do. I, I played, I was singing it very drony before. I'll try and do a kind of slightly more uh, tuneful, um, recorded version, like uh, <laughs> see how it sounds. Go on then, do your Elton John version of it. Yeah, let's Elton John it up. Well, they put him in the ground at All Saints Church. A crowd of people came, can't sing alongside the grieving family and anger grows the same and a fury at the rich man's court where nothing good is done there's fury at the customs man so quick to shoot his guns 
and willful murder that it was, said the warden of the church.